Hey there, Astro Loves, Portia here. And in this video, I will be providing a comprehensive overview of the traditional planets along with the sun and moon within the context of Hellenistic astrology. My goal for you as a student and the viewer of this video is to gain a clear and foundational understanding of the planet's representation and the origins of their significations. So before I get into the heart of the material, I just wanna share with you guys this awesome resource. It is Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune by Chris Brennan. It's been such a like, oh my God, just a deep dive, um, very, very useful resource for me and my own studies and practice. And so if you are curious more about the history of astrology or are curious about Hellenistic astrology, I definitely recommend that book. And um, a lot of what I will be covering in this video derives from this book, as well as from my own personal experience in chart interpretation and um, looking at the transits just to see how we can best work with the energy and how the energy works with us. Okay, so I do feel that Hellenistic astrology is very important when it comes to learning astrology, just from, once again, my own experience. Once I, or firstly, I started out with the modern astrology, which a lot of us have, because it was just, you know, the most easily accessible um, perspective and modern modern astrology is the essentially the astrology of the 20th century and so um, later in in 20th century the hellenistic astrology or more traditional astrology has been revived or it's in its revival phase even as we speak and so more and more of these ancient texts are being translated and it's really what's what's coming through is really giving us an understanding of the origins and the foundations of, you know, Western astrology as we know it, and and why these techniques are, you know, important and what these methods are are, are like stemming from. And so, Hellenistic astrology is the integration <clears throat> of Mesopotamian and Egyptian astrology, and as I said before, it is the origin, the basis, the foundation of Western astrology as we know it. And so, once I started studying Hellenistic astrology and um, really using that in my own chart interpretations for clients and just for transits, I definitely have um, come full circle with this practice and a lot of, of missing pieces have been um, acquired or I've definitely filled in the missing gaps as far as like my understanding of astrology. So <clears throat> this, even though I will be covering just the seven traditional planets, um, this is definitely, I feel very relevant for you if you are studying, even if you are using the modern context. Hmm. Sorry, <clears throat> my voice is not wanting to really come through today. Water might actually help. Okay, so I will only be focusing on the traditional planets and the sun and moon. And the traditional planets are Mercury, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. And the reason why I'm only focusing on these planets is because I wanna pull our attention back to the traditional way of doing things. And I know that can be a little bit um, <laughs> uh, disengaging uh, or something for some people. Cause I know when I started also, like I was like tradition, I don't wanna do anything that's traditional, but I do, want to bring our attention back to how important and significant these planets are in particular to the rulerships of of the signs and how the symmetry is like really beautiful and just as i said before once i started to look at things from this perspective look at the charts from this perspective it definitely opened up a whole new um window of understanding and just it, it cleared a lot of things up for me so as follows Aquarius or Scorpio, Aquarius, and Pisces in modern astrology are ruled by Uran or I'm sorry, Pluto, Uranus, and Neptune. And bringing it back to these traditional planets, we're going to re associate them to their traditional rulers, which for Scorpio is going to be Mars, for Aquarius is going to be Saturn, and for uh, Neptune is going to be Jupiter. And just to throw out there, just a perfect example, because I'm an Aquarius sun, so I was like, I can't really see Saturn being my ruler. When you think about Saturn, you know, ruling boundaries 
And when you think about Capricorn, Capricorn kind of creates those boundaries, those structures, kind of puts in place the limitations, holds that authority. On the flip side, you have Aquarius. They are really envisioning their own rules, their own way, their own perfect society. And they tend to be outside of the barriers that Capricorn has created and outside of those rules and laws. So like when I started thinking of things in that way, and as you know, Aquarius can be kind of dry. Aquarius, you know, has their own kind of fixed like structure in a sense. And so Aquarius does embody a lot of of those Saturn um, significations. And you can definitely see how Saturn, in my opinion, in my practice, and I've been doing both, <clears throat> I have done both. I definitely feel that Saturn is more, it makes more sense and it comes through a little bit more concrete as a ruler of Aquarius than Uranus. And Uranus moves slow, a lot slower. So it's hard to really, <clears throat> really look at it from that perspective. So in this video, I definitely want to pull your attention back to the rulerships of um, the traditional rulerships of these signs. And I will do another video at some point integrating these, these outer planets. Okay, so to begin, or essentially astrology began with the planets, with observing the planets. And from what I've learned, and just what I know instinctually, that is that the significations of the planets stemmed from their observations of what was happening in the sky. And so the planets in from here on out, I will refer to the sun and moon as planets because that's just kind of that umbrella term we do in astrology. And a planet from um, their definition, the ancients definition was considered to be a wandering star. And so with that in mind, these traditional planets, these seven planets were the wandering stars that were we had the ability to see with the naked eye at that time. And so that's, it was really, really significant at that time because you could go outside and really look at the sky and see what was going on. So back in ancient times and ancient times being, this is more of the Mesopotamian um, contribution to you know astrology this is what um we have um inherited from from their particular practice and study and way of living is that you know their astronomers were the astrologers and vice versa and so they would more so study what we or practice what we call mundane astrology which is the study of of the stars or the planets and how they influence the country as a whole or this the city state as a whole or the you know even the kings and kings and, and queens um which was whatever happened with them kind of trickled down to the people so that was really really important and so the study they would look more at at these configurations within the sky as um signs from god that a particular event was going to happen. So they looked at the planets as gods. And down the road, this is how the Mesopotamians were the ones starting um, that originated naming the planets after their gods, because that was, in a sense, their gods. And these ominous, ominous events that would happen they would keep records and over time and it was more so things that stood out like eclipses and, and things of that nature and over time they begin to keep these like they had these detailed records and then they were able to really you know predict what you know where this planet would be at this particular time and this is how natal astrology came came out came about and so with that in mind it these significations weren't placed upon the planet because it was like okay so this is this is mars so we're gonna label that mars or whatever it was called at that time this is we're gonna place these upon you know this particular planet just because you know we want to no it was more so at this time certain things would happen when this particular planet was in this part of the sky so that's how that came about and so moving forward to uh the greeks in hellenistic period they also didn't really associate or give the names to the planets until about the fourth century BCE. 
And so they were more describing these planets in their descriptive terms, like, you know, the light bringer or the fiery one and so forth. And it wasn't until later on they as associated, they pretty much um, inherited what the Mesopotamians did and associated the planetary names or the gods with their gods. And as the names that we use, today is actually uh, Roman names of these planets. So the Greeks also had their own particular names for these planets as well. And so when we get into the significations of the planets, the planets actually stem from, have originated, I mean, a, some of them are from astronomical observations, but over time it was more of this binary system that was created. And so that binary system based on good and evil, masculine and feminine, and so forth. And <clears throat> it was more so, okay, since Mars appears to in this way, Mars is, and we see Mars as like this like red, cold planet, dark, cold planet, then we're essentially associating that with, with darkness, with bad or evil. And also with Saturn, Saturn being dark brown as well, and cold looking and far away and distant, we're gonna associate that with, with bad or with evil. And as they began to do this, they also, you know, to keep things balanced because with ancient astrology, there's a lot of symmetry. You can see it in the rulerships of the signs. And as far as like that binary, the binary pairs between these planets, as opposed to Mars, like as, um, for example, of Mars and Venus and Jupiter and Saturn, you see those um, binary, those opposites um, coming through for that symmetry. So like I said, with Mars and Saturn essentially being <clears throat> the malefic planets is what they would call it in Hellenistic astrology, then Venus being its opposite, you're, you get those um, opposite qualities of good. Um, and then Jupiter also is, an, is the other benefic planet, which is the opposite of Saturn, which is also looked at as the good planet, the fortunate planet. And so, as I said, there's a lot of symmetry here. There's also with the concept of benefic and malefic, there is the concept of just the extremes of these two, of this binary system. And so that's, I feel like that was for me personally, something I kind of struggled with when I came across just traditional astrology before I got into Hellenistic. I mean, this is like way at the beginning, like over 15 years ago when I started. And I saw that and I was just like, well, this doesn't make sense. This can't like, why am I going to look at this as bad and, and good? But as I move forward, I will explain why this is actually helpful. And, and it's really, there's usually no extreme of it being like all good or all bad. There's always some kind of gray area. But to bring your attention back to just the time period that they were in, there were a lot of extremes. I mean, when it came to that darker part of the year and it being cold, like there was a chance that you wouldn't survive. You know, you might not make it into to the next, um, to, to spring. And so there was a concept of feast and famine and, and things of that nature and cold and, you know, and warmth. And so that was really, really um, um, a, a big deal back in that time. And so, as I said, also some of these planet, planet significations stem from the observation and correlation aspect of it. And I want to just mention the mythology part of the planetary significations, because as I learned initially within my astrological studies, that um, we were looking at the planets more in the context of their mythological representation. And so I just want to bring attention to that because with the ancients and with the Hellenistic period, that was not the way that that was, that, that was addressed. And so this was more so, as I said, the significations of these planets are more so derived from just a binary system and having things balanced and also a little bit of observation and correlation. Okay, so benefic and malefic. I want to dig a little bit more into that, although I will leave that for another video as well. We have this benefic and malefic system deriving from the Mesopotamians, and the benefic planets in the chart are Venus and Jupiter, and these were considered to be benefic because in the sky they appear to be bright and white stars. 
And then we had the malefic planets to be Mars and Saturn, which in the sky, they both appeared very dark, Mars being more red and Saturn being more brown. So they associated that with like good and bad. And Mercury, Sun and Moon are the neutral planets. So their energy is pretty much they, you know, they can go either way, depending on their placement within the charts. And if you dig deeper into just the nature of like the benefic and malefic and the binary energy of, of the planets, there are different what they call teams and they call sect. So sect is basically the sector of day and you have the day planets and you have the night planets, um, which comes out more importantly in regard to day and night births. So sect, in a sense, is a qualitative distinction that primarily alters the way the benefics and malefics function in a given chart, right? And so if you have, if you're born during the day, you're, you have your own like team of planets. If you're born during the night, you have your own team of planets. And this sounds like a little bit extra, like they were kind of doing too much maybe, but as I started using this in my own practice, it's definitely helped a lot. It's definitely really just brought some some more um, depth to the chart interpretations and it really really resonate not only with myself but with clients and so okay if you were born during the day you have mars as your challenging planet or your malefic planet and then you have jupiter as your positive or benefic planet also, the placement of the sun within your chart is very prominent, and that's if you're born during the day. And if you were born at night, your challenging or malefic planet is Saturn, and your positive or benefic planet is Venus. And then the moon is more prominent. The moon's placement is more prominent within your chart. And so just to give you a very brief breakdown of why this is the way it is, it is due to those sect teams. So being that um, you have the sun is ruling the, the day chart, and then you have the night is, or the moon ruling the night, or the night chart. And so within those teams, during the day, the prominent planets are going to be Saturn and Jupiter. And then at night, the prominent planets are going to be Mars and Venus. And then, like I said, Mercury is neutral, so mer Mercury can go either way. It can be really, really good or really, really challenging, depending on how it's, it's configured within your chart. Um, if it's aspecting any of the good plan, like strongly aspecting any of the benefic or the benefic in your chart, then it's probably going to come out a little bit more um, productive and, and, and positive. If it's um, um, strongly aspecting the malefic in your planet in your chart, then it's probably going to come out a little bit more challenging um, in the natives chart. All right, so um, I think we're ready to get into the actual planets, and we're just going to go through them. And I'm going to give you some of the um, core significations and give you just an idea of like where they kind of stem from, or you know what the uh, ancients. Um, really looked at to um, come, up, come up with these significations because a lot of the way that we look at the chart and the way we um, interpret or use these, these uh, characteristics are, are, have originated from like a long time ago. So we're still using the same significations and it's, it's very, very um, accurate in my opinion. And the funny thing is it's, it's interesting. I always think of, you know, did we, like belief is a powerful thing and thought is a powerful thing and belief systems, you know, in any way, shape or form, if you have more and more people believing in this particular system, then it definitely becomes reality, becomes truth. I definitely feel that thoughts create things. And so, you know, yes, the ancients were looking at the, the sky and keeping records of what was happening during that time when the sun was a certain place or the moon or, you know, Mercury was in a certain area. And so we begin to create this, build this, this list of significations and occurrences. Um, however, I, I am also just, I always think about is like, did we also, you know, being that we all collectively believe this to be a certain way, this rings true. So it's, it's really interesting to think about. But 
Anyways, getting into the planets. So we're gonna start with the sun first. So the sun, as we know, is the central focus. It gives life to everything here on earth, everything or yeah, everything here on earth. And every, all the planets revolve around the sun. So it is, it makes sense for the sun to be the, the, the center of your identity, your central focus. It also um, correlates to intellect and then the father and masculine energy. And so this really stems from this, this firstly, the, the father and masculine energy, because it also, like the mother, it promotes and sustains life. And it does that by giving the life force, it provides life force energy to all living things. And that life force energy, you can look at as information. And it's this higher intelligence that's coming through that is really um, sustaining that life. And you can look at that as the intellect. And so also with the sun, the sun tends to, it's very, very stable. And um, it goes, it moves about one degree a day. It stays in a sign for about 30, 31 days. Um, and it takes a whole year to go through the whole zodiac, very stable. So I also associate the sun with permanence and stability. And so looking at that, um, you get a lot of those, those um, qualities of the sun, you know, as it rules, you know, our identity, how we feel about ourselves, how we um, look at or how the, our environment orients itself around our identity, because that is a representation of the sun within ourselves, is that it's, we are the central focus. Um, and this is how I will create my environment around me to sustain myself, to give me that life spirit and that energy that I am looking for, or that I need to, you know, keep myself, sustain myself and keep myself going. And as I said, with that father masculine um, correlation, that is more so of being able to sustain and promote life via, you know, the light and the warmth. Okay, and so moving towards the moon, the moon, the biggest, most significant signification of, of the moon is the concept of changes and cycles. And so that is definitely a very astronomical visual uh, correlation there because we see the moon going through these different cycles, you know, so everything that goes through cycles is really important in, for the moon. And that's going to be um, emotions, um, <clears throat> you know, just our thoughts even, um, changes within our bodies, um, especially women, menstrual cycles, how we are aligned with the moon, all of that is, is very, very important. And it makes sense for that to be a correlation, especially when you think about the mother and the feminine energy. And that mother and feminine energy also stems from the sun, the moon receiving light from the sun. So, <clears throat> the sun being also that, like I said, that, that giving that, that life force energy, that vitality is going to, um, it gives that to the moon in a sense, and it receives that and illuminates that in many, so you can look at that in many different ways. And also one of the things that I didn't really understand that correlated to the moon was il illusions. Although, you know, the moon is very captivating and enchanting, which is another thing, but that um, concept of illusions is due to the moon appearing to be bright um, and full of light, but it is stemming really from the illumination uh, of the sun or receiving and reflecting that light of the sun. So that's something that really stood out to me once I had understood it from that context. I was like, oh, that makes sense. And so with the moon always changing, always in cycles, even though its cycles, its phases are pretty, um, it's stable in a sense, it's always changing. And so there is the concept of impermanence or phases. So you can look at someone's chart, look at their moon sign and see how, you know, they, um, are experiencing these changes within their lives or how they experience change within their lives and in whatever area of life house that that moon placement is in that will give you an idea of like what part of their life is consistently going through phases and changes and um, is also really tied into their emotions and how they relate in that sense so you get that and with the moon the moon moves about 13 degrees a day and so it stays in a sign for just two days. 
And so, and it has that 20, 29 day cycle. And so you can see out of all of the um, planets that I'm talking about today, this is the fastest moving one. So it's always changing and moving around. So moving forward, we have Mercury. Mercury, and this is like the last one that really the significations of, of this, these planets really stand out from the uh, astronomical perspective, observation and correlation. But with Mercury, we have communication, we have information and we have exchange that is uh, signified by Mercury's placement. And so where that stems from <clears throat> is also the movements <clears throat> of Mercury within its orbit. Its movement is variable. It's moving around all the time, very, very fast energy. It goes in places that none of the other planets can even dream about touching. And so its variable movement around the sun is what gives it this uh, signification of being able to network and communicate because it's moving into this place and it's here and it's there and it's, you know, conjuncting with this planet and then conjuncting with that planet. And so it's kind of, it's the one that's moving back and forth and sharing information. This is where you get the exchange um, aspect of it too, because it's, it's exchanging information with this one and then taking on information with another and just always moving around. And there's a the concept also with Mercury of above and below. It's the messenger of the planets. It is the medium because of that concept of being able to go above and below, being able to be good and bad, essentially. It's that very neutral energy. So that variable movement around the sun is, is what we really get the concept of Mercury from. And with Mercury, Mercury, um, it gathers information in the more in the sense of providing facts or gathering facts as opposed to the sun with its own information but that's more of like i said that higher intellect that that energy that light that will promote and sustain um, um life and give um information in that sense with mercury it's more so just gathering the facts and the resources and so moving forward we have venus so now with Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, we're getting more into that binary aspect that I mentioned in regard to the planets and <clears throat> their significations. And so this is when we get into what's good, what's bad. Um, and so I will talk about them as the binary pairs. So we have Venus and Mars. They both pretty much kind of had the same movement throughout the day between zero to 16 minutes a day and this is when you can start to see that they're breaking down so this is like a quarter of a degree that they're moving through the sky and it varies depending on where they are in their orbit if they're going to go retrograde soon um so with mars mars rules separation it rules wars it rules that division it rules um cuts laws inflammation and then we have with Venus, Venus rules harmony, reconciliation, binding, attraction, you know, friends, marriage. So really the core concept, when you look at all of the significations between Venus and Mars, the core concept of these is that Mars separates and Venus brings things together. It unites. And so that's when you get with Venus, you get the significations that are, like I said, marriage, contracts. Um, even attraction. If I'm looking at manifestation or if I'm looking at just like working with energy, I like to look at the Venus placement because that is, um, it's the vibrational frequency that you're, that you are um, exerting or that you're taking in. So, and Venus really wants to bring things, like I said, into balance, into harmony. And so that is the core um, elements of the Venus placement within your chart. And the opposition to that is going to be Mars, which Mars is separation just through and through. So what tends to separate? Wars obviously separate, breakups separate. So you have like divorce being the opposite of Venus, which is a marriage. Then you have like, even when you think about the physical body, because there's a lot of that physical will and vitality associated with Mars, because Mars wants to really, like if you think about needing to separate anything, especially if it's one unit, there takes a lot of force and a lot of aggression. And sometimes it can be frustrating. I mean, if you think about dividing like a rock or something like that, it, it's going to take a lot of heat. It's going to take a lot of force and um, a lot of willpower to, to get through. And so then the next two um, pairs are going to be Jupiter and Saturn. And so these are considered to be the um, 
greater benefic and greater malefic more so because they are just bigger they're further away they move a little bit slower than venus and mars as i said venus and mars they both move about zero to 16 minutes per day and with mars it takes about two years to go through the whole zodiac it stays in a sign for about a month and a half and then with venus it stays in a sign for 23 to 60 days depending on what it's doing, where it's at in its orbit. And the cool thing about uh, Venus is that it will take eight years to get back to the same degree. And it ends up forming this really cool pentagram, which I'll do a video on the, the sacred geometry within the orbits in the orbital pairs um, of these planets. But there's a really cool configuration that Venus makes and it definitely has a lot to, like it influences its significations as well. And so, Going back to Jupiter and Saturn, Jupiter stays in a sign for about a year. It has a 12-year cycle, and Saturn stays in a sign for about two and a half years, and it has a 29 and a half year cycle. And so here again, we have the binary pairs where Jupiter is um, the the main signification. I would say with Jupiter is expansion, and the main signification with with Saturn or the core signification with Saturn is limitation i would say and so with jupiter jupiter is all about expansion so there's that also the concept of growth affirmation anything to say yes to keep things going and with jupiter it's more about the the particular growth especially when you're looking at a natal chart it's more about that internal growth that personal development how do you expand consciousness <clears throat> and also with saturn saturn <clears throat> On the flip side, as I said, with limitation, <clears throat> it is more so a focus on <clears throat> really limiting things so that um, it can mature over time. Saturn has that longer, that longer cycle out of all of these planets. So time is a really big concept <clears throat> with Saturn, and Saturn tends to be that planet in your chart that's going to say, no, like because it's like things need to wait, things need time to mature. It isn't ready yet. It isn't right yet. Like Saturn is wants to promote um, mastery in a sense or authority in that in in that way. And so it tends to be the energy that's going to reject you and and push things off until it's time, until it's really marinated. So wherever Saturn is in your chart, it usually will take about. A whole Saturn return, which is about 29 and a half, 30 years for that particular area of your chart to, to really mature and really come into its full manifestation. And so you get that decay quality of Saturn due to, due to the time, because as things are moving forward, naturally you're going to have things um, really die off <clears throat> in regard to um, just things needing to mature and evolve and ripen. And so naturally there's going to be some decay. There's going to be things that are going to um, kind of die off with time. And, but the biggest, the biggest signification of Saturn is going to be that boundary or that limitation as opposed to Jupiter and, and it being expansion, growth, affirmation. And so um, I feel complete with this. I will go deeper with these individual planets in separate videos. If you have any questions or comments, definitely feel free to comment on this video and I will talk to you in the next one.